Father God, thank you. Thank you for loving us as you do. May we love you right back in the way that we honor and serve you also. Thanks for all that has taken place up to this point. And now as we open the very word of God, may we allow your word to speak to us this morning. This morning. Challenge us, Father. Challenge us to be who you called us to be. Challenge us to know that just like the young man we read about today, just like you had a plan for his life, you have a plan for our lives as well. Your will be done in all that we do from this point further in this worship service. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. You may be seated. Turn in your Bibles, uh, if you will. We're going to be working out of the book of Genesis and our focus verses today is going to be Genesis 45, and we're going to be looking at probably the first eight verses of Genesis 45. So you can go ahead and turn there uh, while we are getting ready to, to move forward. Brady, I, I just wondered, uh, where'd Brady go? He, he left? Okay, well, you tell him that I said, uh, ask why was he looking at me when he was talking about old men, okay? <laughs> but that, you know, I don't know about you, but uh, that kind of rings a bell in my life. Now, today, we, we're, going to, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, attitudes. Now, I want, to, I want to calm this down just a little bit. We aren't going to be talking about my attitude. We aren't really going to be talking about your attitude. We're going to talk about a young man named Joseph and his attitude. So it's a lot easier for us to talk about someone else's attitude than it is to talk about our attitude. So I want <laughs> thank you. So I want you to just calm down. We're not uh, we're not throwing any rocks today at all, but we are looking at a young man that, uh, that was, and I titled my message today, First Responder. First Responder. We hear a lot about first responders today, but we're talking about and focusing on a first responder. And where we're going with that thought is that Joseph, the young man that I'll introduce you to just a little bit later, Joseph was his first responder. You and I are, are our first responders to whatever happens in our lives. Whatever takes place in our lives, you and I are the first responder. So we will respond to whether or not we are going to have a good attitude about what is going on or whether we're going to have a bad attitude that what, of what is going on. So that's kind of the direction that we're going in. What I wanted to tell you again is that back in the mid-60s, I became a charter member of the Huddleston Rescue Squad, a charter member of the Huddleston Rescue Squad. Now, what happened, it, they didn't let me drive much because back then I was young, and it was quite dangerous to give me a vehicle that had sirens on it and then a red light on top. So I very seldom got to drive the rescue vehicle. But one of the things that I remember most is not the uh, bloody scenes at an accident or anything like that. It was one that was quite humorous. We got a call. Uh, my, my partner was Milton Cheek. You guys don't know him. Some of you may uh, don't know him, but he... He was the driver that day, and we were called to pick up a man. This was in the wee hours of the morning. He had to wake me up first before we got on the road, and we were called to go to an older man's house, and he was supposedly having a heart attack. Now, we had a, a, a uh, station wagon. I don't know if they still make those or not. You know, now they're all SUVs, but a station wagon was the same height as a car. You didn't have, when you from the floorboard up, you didn't have much headroom. So we went and got this gentleman and put him on the gurney and rolled him up in the station wagon, and his face was about that far from the roof. So he said, I can't ride here like that. So he started getting out, 
And, and we pulled the gurney out. He got out, got in the front seat, and rode to the hospital. Now, it, you know, he wasn't having a heart attack. That was a good thing. But, but that's the one I remember most about some of the calls that I was privileged to go on. But I want to say to all of you that are first responders, thank you. Thank you for what you do. Rescue squad, fire department, police, sheriff's department, all of that. Thank you, because when a first responder responds, someone is expecting that person to at least have some kind of idea of how to handle the situation, of how to handle the situation. So that's kind of where we're going today in our message time. Whenever those things happen in our life, some are good, some are good, then we are the first responder, and we should have some idea of how to respond to that. If it's a good, good uh, thing, then that's easy to respond to. If it's not such a good thing, then that is a little more difficult to respond to. So that's why we're, we've titled our message today, First Responders. Now, we first meet the young man uh, that we're talking about today back in Genesis 37. And in Genesis 37, the first two verses, and Jacob, now remember, Jacob's name was turned to Israel, and he had 12 sons, and that represents the 12 tribes of Israel that we read about, talk about, preach about, study about today in our Bible. So, so and Jacob dwelt in a land wherein his fathers were strangers, and that was in the land of Canaan. Now, let me just remind you a little bit of how Israel got into uh, Egypt as they did. It was a friendly move. When they moved into Israel uh, at the invitation of the next to the youngest son, uh, Joseph, when there was a famine in the land, both uh, in Egypt and also uh, uh, back in Cana, where back where uh, Joseph and his family were living, and the folks were about to starve to death, and it was Joseph that had been abused, not by his father, by his brothers uh, that had been abused, sold into slavery. And it was Joseph that had honored God every step of the way after the early stages of his 17-year-old life. It was Joseph that was the man that, that, in honoring God, that saved Israel from, from starvation or annihilation, uh, if you will. So we're going to be looking at Joseph's attitude as we move further uh, through the message. The Scripture tells us that Joseph was 17 years old. 17 years old. Now, I don't know about you, but I didn't make a lot of good decisions when I was 17 years old. Uh, Joseph really didn't make a lot of good decisions at that age either. You know the story. Keith has preached on this. I think Taylor has too. But let me remind you folks, as I, were, as I was looking back over it, I didn't remember what you preached on or how you preached on it either. So, uh, so this is totally different from what, where you have gone. But, but Joseph was a young, spoiled brat. His father uh, spoiled him. Uh, we know that story. We know that he was a man that had the coat of many colors. We know that he kind of rubbed it in the face of his other brothers as well. So Joseph's early decisions were not real good decisions, and neither was mine. Let me, let me read the Scripture. Actually, I probably should be saving this uh, until the last, but let me read our, our focus Scripture today in Genesis 45. Then Joseph, now that then is after a lot of things had happened. Joseph had been sent out to, uh, to, to see his brothers, see how they were doing uh, by his father. Uh, and that was, uh, incidentally, that was quite a ways away, 25 to 50 miles away, was where Joseph was sent to check on his brothers that were grazing his father's cattle. When he did find them, he got lost one time, and a man saw him and uh, he asked him if he knew where his brothers was, and they said, I heard, he said, I heard they was going up at Dothan, and, and that's where Joseph found them. But when they saw him coming, 
when they saw Joseph coming, uh, they were already uh, angry at him. He'd already kind of played with them a little bit and teased them and uh, let them know in few words that uh, he was the man. He was the man of the family. He let them know that. And when he showed up 25, 30 miles from home, they decided to kill him. One of the brothers stopped them from doing that. That was Reuben. Stopped them from doing that and said, let's just take him and throw him in the pit. They threw him in a pit. And then when they saw some Midianites coming, they took him out and they sold him. And that's how he wound up in Egypt. Honoring God every step of the way. So let me read the scripture and then we'll get back to the outline uh, just a moment. The 45th chapter and we're just looking at the first eight verses. Then Joseph, after he'd gone through all that we've talked about already, then Joseph uh, 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 refrained himself before all them that stood by him and cried and caused every man to go out. Uh, and, and there he stopped and he reminded his brothers who he was. What had happened now, the famine was on. The brothers, uh, Jacob, had sent his sons down into Egypt to buy food. This was probably the second uh, or third trip that they were down there. And that is when Joseph could no longer, could no longer cease to tell them who he was. Now, let me tell you something. Uh, we'll get into this in the outline. But Joseph had already been mistreated by his brothers, had been thrown in a pit by his brothers, had been sold by his brothers. And now his brothers were standing in front of him some 20 to 22 years later, not recognizing him, and he had the upper hand. He had the upper hand. So what I'm saying, sometimes when we have the upper hand, maybe our decision should be a little different from what they are. Maybe our decisions should be a bit more like Joseph. So let's continue to read the Scripture, picking up uh, now at the second verse. And he wept aloud. Now, these are the folks that had sold him, threw him in a pit. Some of them wanted to kill him. He wept aloud, uh, and the whole house of Pharaoh heard him. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. This was the first time that they had heard that this was the brother that they had hated, that they had mistreated, that they had thrown in the pit, and that they had... Uh, had abused, and now they were standing before him begging for food to survive, begging for food to survive. Man, wouldn't we have liked to have been in that position of because of some of our enemies now? How would we have responded? Verse 3, and Joseph said unto his brother, I am Joseph. Uh, does my father know, or, or is my father still alive? Some 22 years later, and his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. They were troubled at his presence. We're going to hop onto that a little bit uh, shortly in our outline. And Joseph said unto his brethren, come near. Come near. Now, this is, the, uh, this is the second or third time that they had been in his presence. And he had teased them a little bit, but nothing to hurt them. And now he's saying, come, come a little closer to me. I can imagine how frightened they might have been knowing now or just finding out who he was and remembering how that he had, they had mistreated him. And Joseph said unto them, I'm Joseph, your brother, verse 4. And Joseph said, come near me, I pray you. And they came near and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into slavery. He reminded them. He reminded them that I am that young boy that you abused, that you abused. And then verse 5, Therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me, for God did send me before you to preserve your lives. Let me remind you folks, that everything that happens in my life, everything that happens in your life, God has a plan. And in this case, the very worst 
plan that God had to get Joseph where he needed to be was not an easy plan for Joseph. Joseph could have forgotten God. He could have said, like we have said sometimes, and I have said, it's just not fair. It's just not fair. Let me remind you of something before we quit today. God always does what is fair. God always does what is fair. Don't ever forget that. I don't know where you are in your life. I don't know what's going on, but God does. God does. Here we find a young man that had every right to be angry, that had every right to get back, but God had a plan for his life. We were reminded throughout the Scripture from from where we began in, uh, in 37, we reminded throughout that portion of Scripture that God was with Joseph. That God was with Joseph. Now, let me remind you something. Let me remind you of something. If you are a child of God, or even if you aren't, you need to be, but if you are a child of God, God is with you wherever you are, Whatever you're doing, even if that doing is not pleasing God, God is still with you. He was with Joseph. And the same God that Joseph was honoring and, and, and trusting through the tough times, the same God is that God that you and I are here today to worship. No different. The Bible reminds us that God is the same yesterday, today, today. And forever. God hasn't changed his mind from the Old Testament to the New Testament. He has just sent Jesus Christ to pay the penalty for your mistakes and my mistakes. And he is still loving us and he has his hand upon us. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever forget that. Let's look at our outline just a little bit while we, uh, while we have time. So we're talking about attitudes. We're talking about first responders. And I had that initially, responders plural. But I took the S off, off of it because you, I, am I, my, I'm my, you're your first responder to whatever happens in your life. And how we respond makes a difference in how we move forward. Some of us are still caught in something that happened way back when. But how we respond is what will make a difference in our lives. How do I know that? It made a difference in Joseph's life. And let me remind you, Joseph, Joseph was human just like you and I. Joseph didn't think different. Joseph didn't act different. Joseph didn't handle problems different only when he trusted God no more than you and I do. So what we're talking about today, we're talking about Melvin. We're talking about Teeth. We're talking about Taylor. We're talking about us. That's what we're talking about. We are our first responder. So let me just take a look first of all. We want to look at Joseph's attitude just a little bit. And I told you we're talking about Joseph's attitude, not ours. We're talking about Joseph's attitude. Early on, 17 years old, Joseph didn't have a very good attitude. He was very selfish. He was sport. Moms and dads don't have a special child in your family. All of them are special. Treat all of them the same. And I know you do that. Treat them all the same. Because the way you treat them makes a difference in how they respond to their brothers and sisters, to other people, to people in school. The way that you treat them at home. So don't have a special child. Jacob did. Jacob's special child was with the first child with his, with his, uh, with his wife uh, that he loved very much. That was who his first child was. First child was with, uh, her name was Rachel. He, he, he favored Joseph. 
So Joseph was very spoiled. He took all of the spoiling that his father gave him, and he kind of rubbed it in with his brothers. Nowhere in the Scriptures did Joseph say, I'm better than you are, but his actions proved that he thought he was, that he thought he was. So Joseph's attitude, and my question here now, and I don't want to get too far away from where we, we, I told you that we were going, is how is your attitude? You see, we decide whether we have a good attitude or whether we had a, have a bad attitude. That is not first responders, the ambulance don't come, the lights blinking, the siren blowing to help us. No, that is our decision. That is our decision. So may we do a little soldier. You don't know about my attitude. I don't know about your attitude. And I don't need to know. You don't need to know about mine. But I need to know about it. And you need to know about yours. So may we do a little soul searching as we move through here and see if our attitude maybe needs some adjusting. That is our second point. Joseph's attitude adjustment. Now, when did that happen? Let me tell you when I think it happened. I think it happened when he had gone out to see his brothers. Uh, his father had sent him out and they saw him coming and they launched in on him. They abused him. <clears throat> the Bible doesn't say they beat him up, but uh, I, I'm sure they roughed him up pretty good. And they threw him in a pit. I think, and this is, you won't find it in your, in your commentaries, I think that Joseph's attitude changed from the time the brothers got him and threw him in that pit. I, I think his attitude changed from the time he hit, went into the top of that pit till the time he hit the bottom of the pit. I think his attitude changed. I think he realized, and he knew God, he knew God, and I think he realized that, man, I, I haven't been a good brother. I don't think he just realized, man, they threw me in a pit. Now what's going to happen next? And then these Midianites began to show up uh, along the way, and, and the boys saw them coming, and they sold him to the Midianites. Uh, point number three, uh, attitude of acceptance. I think that Joseph's attitude changed when he realized that he was no longer in control. Sometimes that's when we begin to change. Sometimes that's when we begin to seek help beyond ourselves. I think that his attitude began to change and I think he accepted the fact that now I am in the bottom of a pit. There's nothing I can do. My life is at the mercy of someone else. And thank God that mercy was at the mercy of God. Your future and present is at the mercy of God. May we never, ever forget that. So Joseph accepted his attitude. In order to change anything, you and I have to accept what is. Right now, we're just talking about attitudes. Joseph accepted his attitude as not being right, and now he realized that he had to be dependent upon God and God's presence. You and I have to do that too, folks. You and I have to do that. We have to be dependent upon God, and we have to be dependent upon God's presence. We have to be dependent, dependent upon God's forgiveness. So Joseph accepted his attitude, and he accepted the fact that now it needs to change. Because if I don't survive this, I'm going to be in the presence of God shortly. If I do survive this, then God needs to be my guide rather than me myself. God needs to control my attitude, and for God to control my attitude, we have to allow Him to control our attitudes. And then my last point today is Joseph's attitude of forgiveness. I don't think, I don't think that I could have responded like Joseph, I hope maybe that you could have, and I hope maybe that you do respond 
a bit more like Joseph. When Joseph uh, identified himself with his brothers, he forgave what had taken place. He recognized something that you and I folks need to recognize, that I need to recognize, maybe you don't. But he, he, he accepted something that I need to recognize in my life. And in the verse 5, Therefore, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves. Joseph's feelings turned more for his brothers than it had ever been before in his young life when he was living among them. His feelings changed. Don't be angry at yourself that you sold me. That was a big reminder to them. Yeah, he remembers. The first thing they probably thought, I hope he don't remember. But now he tells them he does remember. But it was more of a forgiving thought, an easing tension thought than any other. Now, therefore, be not grieved nor angry at yourself that you sold me as you did. Or that you treated me as you did. That you abused me as you did. Don't be angry about that. And here is the clincher in the whole thought of the message today. God did, God, you didn't sell me. God did send me here before you to preserve life. Joseph realized, I don't know how much earlier, we know that God blessed him in interpreting dreams. We we all know that, and we know that he stayed in prison a while uh, because of something that he didn't do after he got to Egypt, but he continued to trust God. He continued to trust God, and he realized that my journey, my journey is God's plan for my life. Folks, your journey, my journey is God's plan for my life. Somebody, somebody out there somewhere, not necessarily in here, somebody out there somewhere is that I am going to influence as I move forward as long as I stay in God's will and honor God. Now let me bring it on back into Hillsford Church. Somebody out there, maybe your family, maybe your best friend, Maybe your schoolmate, maybe your wife or your husband. Somebody out there. God has a plan and is moving your life in the direction that it is going in order to influence someone out there. And the only person that can abort God's plan for your life, for my life, for the life of Hillsford Church, is you and I. Nobody else can do it. Nothing that anybody else can do to us will change God's plan. Nothing that these brothers did, and, and Joseph recognized that, nothing that these brothers did could change God's plan for his life. Only Joseph, only Joseph, could have aborted God's plan for his life. Now, again, I don't know where you are. I don't know what's going on. I don't need to. But you, God has a plan for you, just as he has a plan for me, and we're the only ones that can abort that. Somebody, somebody might live in heaven And are spend eternity in hell because of your and my submitting to God's will. Submitting to God's plan for our life. Following the route that God had planned for us to go. What happened on this route? Joseph matured. He matured age-wise. He matured spiritually. May you and I accept where we are because we know that God has taken us somewhere special 
to be something special to someone, whoever that someone might be. Father, thank you again. Thank you for our challenge today. Maybe this is just for me. Maybe it's not for anyone else. If it's just for me, may I accept that and realize that you planned my journey and you knew where I needed to go to get where I needed to be. Maybe someone in the house is on that journey, not real sure why they're where they are. But may we accept the fact that God has plans for our life. God has taken us somewhere, maybe like the children of Israel. Maybe we're going to wonder for a long time where we are and why we're here. But God, you have a plan for our lives, and may we never forget that. May we accept what comes our way and make great, good attitude adjustments as we move forward. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.